All right. Um, welcome. I am Tig, for anyone that I haven't met. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher and a contemplative artist. Uh, I teach at the Mayo Clinic. We're just about to launch the Center for Mindfulness there um, in a week. Um, I also teach at Brown University for a research study uh, measuring the effect of contemplative practice on young queer adults. And uh, I also teach contemplative art classes at Pratt Institute in New York. Um, so uh, we've been in this class, we've been exploring ethics, embodied ethics. Um, and so we're at class nine. I think that's the last one of the series. Um, so we're here at the virtual San Francisco Dharma Collective, uh, which as I've been saying this entire time has been a embodiment of these exploration of ethical ways of being in the world. Um, so this embodied ethics series has been um, exploring the concept of ethics, the concept and practice of ethics um, from a relatively non-traditional standpoint. Uh, oftentimes ethics are, are taught um, as something very heady, we think about them, something very intellectual, which is good and we need that, um, but also we need the embodiment aspect of it. So embodiment in two different aspects. One is that we have to be with the feelings in our body in order to let them guide us into uh, ethical ways of being. Um, a lot of times I feel that it's our body that's kind of the inner compass of telling us whether we or others around us or the systems that we're participating in are constructive or destructive. We can feel that in the body. Um, we, don't, we don't really need to think about that to know. Uh, and so, um, great. So um, embodiment, two aspects. One is the felt experience of it. And then the other is the, the idea of embodied ethics is the modeling of them. Um, so how do we show up in ethical ways? How do we embody kind of our own um, ideas of morality and our principles and values um, in a constructive way? So there's both the kind of the embodiment as feeling and then the embodiment as the modeling. A lot of this class has really focused on our current economic system uh, because that is really where we have such strong examples of the destructive nature of a system that's operating without safety nets of ethics, safety nets of ethics, or at least strong or equitable ones. Um, and so we've been exploring in this class kind of how capitalism as a system of oppression, systematic racism, ageism, ableism, um, all of these very harmful uh, systematic ways that capitalism holds certain people down. Um, and also what it's doing to our minds, the lack mindset, um, the psychological manipulation of participating of just even, even just being exposed to selling tactics and marketing tactics. Last week we talked about how in capitalism marketing is used to convince people they need something that they might really not and then charging them for it, which is like super unethical. So what that's doing to our minds, um, feeling like we're not enough or we don't have enough, comparing ourselves to other people, what they have, um, and also what it's doing to our hearts. You know, a lot of the the series we've been exploring very heartfelt con or heart based concepts like compassion, altruism, um, and so this this system that we're participating in that sees. Um, human labor and effort as capital that sees um, the exploitation of others as a, a common and accepted aspect of it. The commodification and the object, objectification of the human body, um, the separation that capitalism thrives on, that we all need to be separate and individualistic. These are all very damaging to, to our heart, to our um, ability to connect with ourselves, with each other, to value and appreciate each other. Um, also what capitalism is doing to our planet. So last week we talked a lot about overconsumption, 
Um, so the, the interconnectivity that we're not independent from our planet, yet capitalism with this growth mindset is not sustainable. So we're destroying our planet through our form of economy. Um, so I think it's pretty clear that there's a lack of ethics showing up very strongly in, in this area. Um, so this class has become less about tearing down capitalism, rather how do we feel our way through it? How do we let our, the embodiment of the felt experience guide us um, to ethical ways of being? But also how do we protect our hearts and our minds and our body from the destructive effects of all of this unethical systems and ways of being in the world? Um, so we have been exploring concepts like interconnection, um, interdependence, that we're all related, that we don't exist in a vacuum, even though we live in a world that uh, has trained us to believe that we do. Um, so how important it is for us to understand where our food is coming from, where our clothing is coming from, um, any, anything that we buy, uh, how is that connected to the grand scheme of things? And not just in the past, but also in the future. What happens to all these clothes when we're done wearing them? Um, what happens to all the packaging that uh, the products that we consume when we throw it out? You know, there's these, I don't know the exact numbers, but there's a shockingly low amount of recycling actually makes it to a recycling center. So we've kind of explored broadening our awareness to see um, the interconnection of all of those things. Another foundation in this um, series has been our shared humanity. So um, majority of this presentation has been secular. Uh, so secular ethics, not based on any religious or supernatural worldview. And so in lieu of not having that shared religion or worldview, what we do have is our shared humanity, our shared beingness. Um, the desire to be well and to avoid suffering. We can all relate to that. Um, so that is the interconnection and the shared humanity as the basis for these ethical explorations that we've been doing. Uh, so we went deeper into the concept of do no harm. We talked for two classes about compassion and capitalism and how the, um, the desire, the aspiration to alleviate suffering is not really compatible with the capitalist economic system. Uh, and how do we resolve that? How do we come to terms with that? We also explored gratitude, not necessarily as an ethic, but as a practice in um, cultivating uh, appreciation, generosity certainly as an ethic, um, but also that can lead to an alternative form of economy. So we talked a lot about gifting economy um, with that class on gratitude. And then last week we talked about uh, kind of ethical consumption, our sources of happiness and uh, materialism and kind of finding that inner light. So we're gonna continue a little bit of that exploration tonight. Um, I'll be sharing uh, some more on um, what that means for me. Um, we didn't have time last week. Um, and then we will um, we'll have a more of a reflection. I would say it's, it's less of a meditation practice and more of a contemplative reflection um, kind of on, on ethics since this is the last class uh, of this series. So kind of a way of... Um, being with what ethics mean to us and how we can move into the world uh, in a more constructive manner. So we, um, we've been talking this entire series about awareness. It feels like if awareness is probably the, uh, the common thread that's running through a lot of these, these concepts. Um, and even awareness, embodied awareness or mindfulness as an ethic in its own right. So the awareness of how things are feeling, which I already mentioned a little bit, interoception, the ability to feel inside the body as a compass for ethical ways of being. Oh, this doesn't feel right. Or when I think about where my food came from, I start getting tightness in my chest or something like that. So the ability to be with the felt experience that we're having uh, and cultivating that through interoception is very important. 
also this this idea of um, listening, the deep listening practice that comes from even just sitting and concentrating on sound as the object of a mindfulness practice can really help cultivate that awareness of how we we listen and interact to each other. Um, and then also our awareness of mental formations and our thoughts and um, the ability to not be pulled around by our thoughts, but also, but to be able to choose. Is this a constructive thought? Is this a destructive thought? As I had shared, a lot of times I have thoughts that come through that aren't always the most ethical, but it is my mindfulness practice. It's my awareness of those mental formations that gives me the space to not react to them or to not be on autopilot um, as much. So I wanted to just uh, bring that, that forward around how awareness and mindfulness practice can be um, applied to this conversation around ethics and outside of practice that we can apply this awareness to our actions, how we move about in the world, how we consume, how our, in, in, uh, how our actions impact others and how things feel. So I'd like to um, just do a shorter opening meditation tonight, maybe about 10 minutes, just to tap into some of that, that felt experience of embodied awareness as a way of cultivating uh, a sense of ethical ways of being by feeling, um, cultivating the deep listening uh, skills, and then an awareness of what's happening in our mind. So this will be a pretty, a, a fairly short exploration of those sensory experiences also with uh, a very short question um, to consider at the end, which we have some time to share about. So with that, let's transition to a period of, of practice and whatever that means for you, maybe sitting up a little bit taller, perhaps allowing the feet to come flat on the floor. Maybe you'd like to stand up or lay down for this practice. Maybe for you, it means just staying exactly as you are. And either softening the gaze or perhaps closing the eyes. And just noticing what's here as we start to slow down a bit and invite the body into stillness. Just inviting the awareness into the present moment by noticing what's alive for you in this moment. Maybe you're noticing a busy mind, lingering energy from conversations or activities today. Perhaps you're noticing a mood or an emotion or multiple emotions that are here right now. And maybe it's a feeling or an energy in the body that you're noticing most vividly. So just taking a, a few moments to settle in, to notice, to welcome yourself exactly as you are. Even if there's a busy mind or unpleasant sensations or thoughts, this is your present moment. And there's no worry or need to show up in a certain way. Just being exactly as you are in this moment. Perhaps you'd like to invite a sense of ease into the somatic field. Perhaps considering softening the muscles of the face, the jaw. Perhaps a softening down the back of the shoulders. And checking the abdomen, the pelvic floor for any squeezing or bracing. And just noticing any areas of obvious tension in the body and what happens when you bring your awareness to those areas. 
Sometimes they may soften and relax, other times not so much, and that's okay as well. No need to force or strive to relax. And so already, even in the opening moments of this practice together, we're using our awareness just to scan what our experience is like right now. So we're already practicing mindfulness, an embodiment of our awareness. And so to deepen that, we can come to an awareness of the breath or perhaps another sensation somewhere else in the body. Perhaps the feeling of the body making contact with the floor or chair or cushion. Maybe there's another particular sensation coming forward in your awareness that you would like to rest your mind with. And if you're with the breath, just noticing the flow of the air as it moves in and out. No need to force or manipulate the breath, just allowing the breath to be as it is and gently allowing the mind to settle around that experience of the breathing body. And you may notice that the awareness is shifting from a felt experience of sensation into thoughts or sounds. If that happens, it's not a problem. In fact, it's the return from the moving mind that helps strengthen our pathways to presence. And for the next few moments, see this practice of feeling the body as a training, a proving ground for embodiment of ethics, an embodiment of the felt experience that we have as we move through the world. In other words, we're practicing feeling. And then with a sense of curiosity, let's make a transition from the felt experience in the body to listening. Bringing the awareness to the eardrums and shifting to the sense of sound. And just noticing the steady and consistent sounds versus sounds that may arise and then disappear more quickly on top. Moments of silence in between. Sounds that we may assess as pleasant or unpleasant and noticing how the mind may respond to those different sounds. And just maintaining that sense of ease and relaxation as we allow the waveforms of sound to come to the inner eardrum. And know for the next few moments that we're practicing deep listening as a platform for ethical ways of being. Listening to our hearts, listening to each other, listening to that inner compass to guide us forward. But for now, just resting with the sound.
And again, no judgments or evaluation of the practice. If the mind is wandering, you're getting a master class and returning again and again. It's not a problem. In this practice, there's no such thing as being good at meditating. Just simply noticing the experience as it unfolds. And then just for a few moments, let's shift from listening to sound to listening to the mind. So shifting our awareness to the domain of the mind, becoming aware of thought forms, whether they arrive as words or images, maybe colors or shapes. And not identifying as the thinker, rather the one that is aware of the thoughts. Allowing some space to open up between us as the observer and the signals that you're receiving as thoughts. Anytime you notice that the awareness has fused with a thought or is following one thought, leading into another thought, into another thought, it's okay. It's just the mind doing its thing. Whenever that happens, we can notice that we become lost in a thought and perhaps just pulling back, leaning back in the mind rather than fusing with the thought forms, just simply stepping back and watching them. And again, this awareness of our mental formations is also a training in ethical ways of being. The more we become aware of what's happening in the mind, the more we can choose, we can create space to choose constructive ways of being in the world. And in a moment, we'll make our final transition, kind of putting it all together, the felt experience and the body and the movement of the mind as you hear two questions. The first is an invitation to recall something that you or another person or an organization did that's ethical. something that benefited others, something that has a constructive or beneficial or benevolent result. It can be as simple as holding a door or as big as laws to protect others. But just considering one example that you have heard or experienced lately of something ethical. And as you hold that event or experience in the mind's eye, notice how does that feel? How does it feel in the body? Is there a sensation that arises? Is there a 
experience in the mind or the heart that's associated with reflecting on this ethical example. Maybe you can label or find a word to describe that experience that arises when you recall this example. And then shifting gears now to call to mind something that is unethical that you have witnessed. Maybe it was something that you may have done or you saw another person acting. Maybe an unethical action of a government or organization, something that causes harm or destruction to others or the planet. And as much as it feels comfortable to do so, notice how that feels. Sensations in the body, reactivity in the mind or in the heart of witnessing this destructive behavior. And maybe there's a word or a label to describe this feeling. And as we come to an end of this practice, let's Perhaps invite some movement into the fingers and toes, perhaps making some gentle stretches. Just taking your time to transition from your inner world, returning back to open eyes if they were closed, allowing an awareness of light to come back into your attention. So hello to those that joined during those practice. Always nice to open eyes and see those that have joined. So I wanted to just take um, maybe just a few minutes if you wanna add into the chat um, a feeling, just one word of what it was like when you were reflecting on that ethical or constructive example. And then one word to describe what it was like when you were reflecting on the unethical or destructive example. So maybe just a word or two. Thank you, Tia, warm at ease. Mine was definitely a temperature associated as well. It was like a warm and a cold. Um, so feeling that with you, Tia. Yeah, so you no, know, I'm also reporting a, a feeling of temperature, a warmth. Leslie's saying grateful, gratitude, furious, anger. Lance, gratitude, distraught. Okay, take care, Zoo. Yeah, so we can see that there's this felt experience. It's ethical, isn't it? ethics isn't just this thing that happens in the mind. It's a, a full body experience, full sensory experience. Um, yeah, so I think this just really illustrates as we read what other people are saying, um, that this is, again, an example of our shared humanity that we all have these responses to constructive ethics and destructive unethical ways of being. So thank you all for sharing that. I know sometimes it might seem a little obvious, but as we were saying at the beginning of the class, it's this embodiment. So even if they're uncomfortable examples, it's a sense of embodiment. And this is where 
it really begins. You know, this has been kind of the theme of the class is being with our experience. It's very easy for us to turn our head and look away from things that are uncomfortable or unpleasant or numb ourselves. Um, and so it takes bravery to actually turn and look at what's uncomfortable and be with how it feels. Um, so thank you all for illustrating that in your in these examples. So last week we talked about how we move beyond materialism, kind of exploring ethical sources of happiness. So um, I think not all of us were there last week. So just a, a short explanation of that. We talked about um, examining happiness, sources of pleasure from an ethical perspective, um, kind of making sure that our sources of happiness and pleasure do not cause harm um, to the planet, to other people, even ourselves, um, specifically in relation to overconsumption, waste, our carbon footprint, um, how, how our uh, sources of happiness might actually be fueling destructive or oppressive aspects of capitalism, the, the um, mass consumption. Um, and so we were focusing on these words, eudaimonia and hedonic happiness. So hedonic happiness being the source of happiness that comes from external sources. Um, so food, gifts, uh, presence of another person, the sunshine, um, things that happen externally that bring us happiness. Not to say that they're, they're wrong um, or they're bad, uh, there's definitely a continuum that we talked about last week, kind of when hedonic happiness swings into um, our happiness being dependent on those material things, the overconsumption, mass production, and acknowledging that in a lot of ways it is making life easier, more convenient, more independent, but at what cost? Because it's destroying the planet, our communities, it's creating a dependence on external sources um, solely for our happiness. And again, to say that uh, hedonic happiness is not bad or wrong, only when it swings into the extreme does it seem to um, amplify these destructive aspects of, of our world, uh, sustainable growth, resource depletion. And then on the opposite side, we have, um, or before talking about eudaimonia, just to wrap up hedon hedonia, this concept of ethical hedonism, so seeking sources of pleasure and happiness that don't cause harm to others, um, don't cause harm to the planet or ourselves. So again, bringing our awareness to how we are seeking external happiness uh, and, and the impact that that might be having. And then there's eudaimonia. So this is the opposite of hedonia, eudaimonia being happiness that comes from within. Um, kind of the, um, the idea that we talked a lot about last week about the inner light. Uh, last week we did a practice where we kind of went into what we call the windless cave of the heart. Um, so it's not bothered by the external, it's not bothered by the storms that are happening outside the cave, that's hedonia. The eudaimonia is the windless, the stillness inside the cave of the heart. And oftentimes it's used, uh, a light or a candle or a flame is, is used to describe this, this inner light of eudaimonia. Um, and so uh, we talked a little bit about how to cultivate eudaimonia through self-reflection, through getting clear on what our values are, the pursuit of virtue. So a lot of the ethics that we've been talking about here, wisdom, courage, compassion, um, justice, uh, acting ethically, um, and embodying these constructive ways of being um, is something that helps cultivate a sense of eudaimonia. It's not dependent on the outside. Even though the result might be external, it's coming from within. Uh, and as we, we're practicing here, a lot of conversation around mindfulness, the embodied awareness, this helps cultivate eudaimonia, taking care of ourselves, being clear on what our goals are, and then um, the last example we talked about was this idea of giving back or, or being in service. And even though that does require external conditions, that service is coming from within, that kind of karma yoga idea is coming from this uh, place of eudaimonia. 
Um, and also important to note that this is very personal for everyone. So it will vary for each of us what eudaimonia means, what it looks like, what it sounds like. And it requires a lot of ongoing reflection, practice for me personally, uh, my practice of loving kindness and compassion and gratitude. These have been mainstays in my practice of tapping into my inner light, uh, independent of what's happening around me. So as I shared last week, I wanted to just talk a little bit about a personal story, um, kind of how I came into a better understanding of my own eudaimonia. As I've been sharing in this course, I had kind of my spiritual awakening in 2012. I found myself as a creative director in a, a marketing role and um, was felt a lot of disgust and contempt once I kind of woke up and realized um, the harm that my work particularly was doing on the psyche of the customers, the damage that the, I, I was working in, um, in retail, the damage that the production, mass production and shipping of all the product and the packaging does to the planet, um, how we treat our people, kind of work-life balance issues. Um, and I had to sit with it for a little while because there wasn't like an immediate, uh, I, knew, I knew it wasn't comfortable and I knew I didn't want to participate in it, but I didn't know what to do. I was kind of frozen for a little while and just needed some time to feel it. And there's a very specific example um, that happened in 2015. So this is a couple of years into me exploring this where um, I walked into my apartment in San Francisco uh, it was sunset, the sun, the, the entire apartment was glowing. It was like golden hour. And um, for 15 of the 20 years of my career, I spent um, overseeing the international part of our business. And so as I looked around and scanned the room, I saw all of these things that I had gotten from all over the world, like little figurines and trinkets and art and cards and it was so beautiful and it was all glowing and sparkling. And as I looked around the room, all of a sudden I had this really strong feeling that the sense of contentment and, and inner peace that I was having was not coming from any of those things. It was probably one of the most beautiful, aesthetically beautiful moments of my life, looking at all of this stuff and the sunshine and the space and feeling gratitude for it and realizing that what I was feeling was not coming from what I was looking at. And in that moment, my orientation to things that in that moment I had, up until that moment, I had assigned as my belongings, things that I owned, it felt totally irrelevant to frame these things as mine. Um, I didn't even feel like I needed them at that point. Uh, it, there was like this shift that happened um, and I was no longer dependent on that, all of that external, uh, all those external objects for this inner peace. Now, I will say a caveat, we need food, we need clothing, we need shelter. I'm not saying to abandon that. But in that moment, I think it was the first time that I actually felt eudaimonia. I felt where this sense of happiness was coming from inside of me. And in that moment, as I described, the relationship to what I had assigned as my belongings completely shifted. Um, my relationship in that moment to the economy and, and how I was participating in it also completely shifted. I did want to quit my job in that moment because it had been building. You know, I didn't want to participate in capitalism anymore. I didn't want to participate in marketing. Um, but it was in that, it was almost like a switch went off for me. I do attribute this to uh, a lifelong practice of loving kindness and compassion and cultivating, you know, I still consider myself to be a baby in these realms. Um, like I'm just getting started, even though I've been practicing for years now. But I think that it was those practices that allowed almost this heartfulness to come forward. Um, and I'm not even talking in that moment about other people. I'm just saying my sense of peace and satisfaction um, was, was no longer coming from that outside area. Um, and so in that moment, I realized I didn't need to hold on to all of this stuff anymore. 
And so I guess, you know, the Buddhists will call it renunciation. I just, I started detaching from my happiness. Doesn't mean that I immediately got rid of everything and went and lived, you know, in the woods. It took time. <laughs> uh, but what I started doing was going through all of my things with this filter of, you know, like it's super cliche. Does this bring me joy? And I started realizing almost like none of it was really bringing me joy. Um, and so it became very easy for me at first to just thin everything down. I had a wardrobe. I'm, I'm mainly talking about clothes. I'm a gay man that worked in retail. I had like 600 pieces of clothing. <laughs> so I think that, you know, sorry for the stereotype there, but uh, I just started thinning down. I started noticing like, oh, I only wear like these 10 shirts and yet I have like 50 of them and I keep buying more. And so I started packing everything up that I didn't need and I just left it in boxes. I didn't, didn't need it anymore, but I wasn't quite sure what I was doing if I wanted to get rid of it. And after a little while, I felt like, okay, yeah, I don't, I, it's, still, it's still staying with me, this feeling of inner peace and satisfaction. So it felt safe to start letting go of things. And the more that I started letting go of, the more I started realizing, wow, I don't really need this apartment anymore because I don't have all of this stuff. I got down to like 50 or 60 items. And then once I realized I didn't need the apartment anymore, I was like, well, so I don't really even need that job to pay for an apartment to hold things that I don't even need anymore. And it was just this moment of complete freedom um, that I didn't need to participate anymore in that way. I will pause for a moment and acknowledge privilege comes into this, the privilege of being in a male body, the privilege of being, of having white skin that allowed me to even have a job like that in the first place. And I do think it's, I, I want to be careful when I'm sharing this story, because I know that there are certain privileges that I was afforded that allowed me to access this moment that others don't have. Um, but also with that, I decided to dedicate my life to exploring different ways of relating to that because I know people are busy, they have families to raise and keep food on the table and health insurance, especially in America, like we have to stay with that in order to survive. But my privilege was allowing me uh, opportunity to start exploring other options. Um, and so I eventually quit my job, moved out of the apartment. I have been for nine years now, I've been, um, everything I own fits into a bag and I've been living undomiciled. This is how I'm doing it. It doesn't mean that I'm saying everyone does, um, but I kind of embarked in this journey of exploring and experimenting with resource-based sharing and gifting, house sitting, trading. Um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about over the course of this series, um, over the past eight or nine years, I've been kind of dipping my toe in, and it has been amazingly liberating and also extraordinarily difficult because I'm still operating inside unethical ways of being. So it takes a lot of energy to protect myself, takes a lot of energy to figure things out, to kind of go against the stream and to get my basic needs met in these ways, it takes a lot of effort. And so I feel like I've kind of found finding this middle ground of like one foot in the system and one foot out. And I want to offer this other um, kind of analogy that I've been working with. It's been very helpful in terms of how I orient myself to what I consider to be a highly unethical country, culture, way of being this example of a slaughterhouse. And I felt like when I had my spiritual awakening, I felt like I woke up in the slaughterhouse and I was like watching everyone around me um, suffering, myself included. And the first thing I wanted was out and I ran. I got rid of all my stuff. I went and lived in a monastery in the Himalayas for a year, continued traveling in India for another six months after that, as far away from that slaughterhouse as I could get. And then I realized I'm alone. And all my friends are in the slaughterhouse and this isn't fun. And so how, how do I now, like, you know, I, I use the image of like, there's a slaughterhouse and then there's the woods, like the forest behind it and I was hiding. And so what I've been finding is this analogy of what is the fence? How can I approach the fence around the slaughterhouse and, and hold it down so other people can jump out, um, but not get sucked into the slaughterhouse? 
And I'm sharing this because these are my, these, this is how I am figuring my path through what I consider to be a highly unethical world, both the, um, the idea of uh, renunciation, moving with my eudaimonia, letting that carry me rather than solely hedonia, hedonic happiness. And then also this analogy of how do I orient myself with this slaughterhouse of destruction um, and harm that our society is participating in, but also to serve others and not be alone. So that's how I've been doing it. And I wanted to just open it up for the next maybe 13, 15 minutes to just hear any thoughts that you may have about what I shared or things that you wanna share about how you orient yourself to a unethical world or a problematic world. A big theme of this class has been for people to come forward and participate and, and share as well. So what does that mean for you? What does that look like for you? Or what questions might you have or points that are sticking out for you? And you're welcome to put it in the chat or just unmute yourself and share here. No. Um, thank you for sharing, Tig. That was really, that was really cool. I've heard some of that, but <laughs> that was good to hear the whole thing. Um, there's so much I could say, but the two things that come to mind for me, uh, one is, uh, just a, an orientation of trying to live as lightly as I can within the constraints of, you know, my life and, and the, the part two, which I'll get to in a moment. But, you know, so really minimizing what I consume. And it's, uh, it's tricky. And it's kind of like, it's super ongoing. It's like every day, <laughs> like every time I go grocery shopping, you know, what decisions do I make? Um, and, you know, and there's all these balances between, you know, like I try to avoid shopping uh, online because I'd rather, you know, get things locally that feels less wasteful, but sometimes I can't find them or I'm in a hurry or something. So it's just this constant uh internal struggle for me but the 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 sort of background is just try to consume as little as possible and yet i i i have to talk myself into stuff and i always have different reasons why so that's one thing and and the other thing is just being uh being a mensch trying to be a good person and you know my i'm very, very fortunate that the work that i do which i love is um, in most respects, helpful to others. You know, I'm an educator. I work in public schools, and it doesn't feel like I'm. Um, I am participating in a system that is very that is in some ways very problematic. But I'm the work I do is an attempt to change it from the inside and to you know attend to those who are who who most need my support within it. So those are the two things that come to mind. Mm. But I guess the big theme is it's like constant, constant vigilance. <laughs> it's constant. Yeah. It, yeah. It it's like, oh, I'm going to just, you know, I recycle done. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing that. No. Yeah. Minimizing consumption. Definitely. And the the this it's very clear what you're saying about like it takes effort it takes energy you know to stay on top of it it's like a daily practice yeah, yeah. um and thanks for sharing about you know how you feel you orient to your role as a teacher and it's almost like there's a source of eudaimonia there you know a sense of satisfaction that you are providing yeah thanks no
I, um, I absolutely identify with the, it's a ongoing, they're ongoing decisions. Um, and, the, but they also feel like the same ongoing decisions of like, okay, I'm going to get out of bed today, right? So it, it really does fall into that category for me. And like my expectations of myself are so unmet. Like it's uh, it's not just a constant re-examination about what my decisions are and what do I know today that I didn't know yesterday because that learning is continuous, but also the what I can do and like the the like causes and conditions that allow you to do a thing or not do a thing. Like my causes and conditions become more and more complicated as my learning increases. So I learn new ideas, but they're not necessarily ideas that I have any success implementing. And it's a trip and it's rough. Um, and, you know, I've got some even like big goals, like uh, I had a I had a plan about when I was gonna stop drinking coffee, right? And I'm not ready. Like it's my best friend, and I'm not letting go yet. Um, and uh, my involvement with plastic fruit that gets on an airplane, like I made it. I have made decisions multiple times in my life that I don't want to eat fruit that got on an airplane. <laughs> and uh, and yet I choose it, right? So it's. Uh, uh, and like that, like that super is very evident to me when it's strawberries and blueberries and not evident to me when it's bananas and pineapples, it's really trippy, like what gets in the filter and what doesn't. So I, I just have a lot of conflict and constant examination. And I'm super curious what I am actually able to do when I'm doing less caretaking. Um, and I do need to say that my taking care of my mother at home is 16 gazillion times few, less waste than if she were in a facility or a hospital. So oh, that yeah. I'm doing, but there's a lot of stuff that I have done previously, want to do, have tried to do that I haven't been able to sustain. So yeah, all of that, all of that at the same time. Thank you, Tia. A for effort. <laughs> How does it deal when, if you if you feel up for answering this, when, so you were naming very bravely, you know, your intentions and goals around sustainability and to varying degrees of sometimes it happens and other times not. And then there was like a, a sense of conviction and energy that was coming through when you were talking about like your, it, almost for me, I was almost interpreting it as a sense of like empowerment uh, like I'm doing that I'm caretaking at home. So you have these two things, right? This like really ethically minded, sustainable aspect of caretaking for your mom at home. And then you have these aspirations that are not always coming to fruition. When you have both of them, how does that feel? Or when you consider both of them? I'm, I'm really able to give myself the gold star and the A plus when I'm actually, when my mom's in a facility and I'm like, oh my God, look at all of this plastic just to have lunch, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, okay, that's not going on in my house. Um, and, you know, I don't know that I would recommend, uh, the medical system needs a lot of work and and going back to, previous less I don't know germs are complicated and and I can do what I'm doing I get this gold star because my mom and my germs have been cohabitating for so long right I understand that it's not sustainable for a facility to do what I'm doing uh to be as lax in so many ways as I am uh or as the doctor once said to me when my dad's peg came out like so that's the one that feeds right into your stomach and it came out and I took him to the hospital to put it back in he's like you can just stick it back in and I'm like just wash it off and stick it back in he's like you don't even need to wash it off I'm like I am bringing him here to you please put this in correctly <laughs> but he wasn't kidding right so there's a there's there's things that I get because because 
we've got the same germs that that they can't have elsewhere. So, but I do feel that gold star, and I am pleased that I'm not adding to that on a daily basis, um, and that I'm able to do that. Um, yes. And and I feel really horrible about the other things, either really in the background or really in the forefront, depending on you know the alignment of the stars and how cloudy it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think that this is a really important point is that like, even even in, in my own my own journey, like I still produce waste, I still have a carbon footprint, right? And I think even like the perfectionism of trying to be ethical <laughs> and sustainable is also a hangover effect of the capitalist conditioning that we have, right? We got to be perfect at it. So I appreciate that you're you're naming that, but I think the big thing that I really hear and feel when you're talking about that gold star, like let's celebrate the things that we do do in our lives to reduce our footprint or to act ethically, knowing that I, I like to think of it as an experiment. We're just experimenting, right? And so maybe one day I eat an apple that came from an airplane, and maybe the other day I'm really focused on this big win because uh, it's more sustainable to take care of mom at home. It's about being with both of those. So I, you know, I really appreciate that that you're illustrating that. Thank you. Maybe time for one more. And it doesn't have to be things that you do, you know, just kind of questions or responses that you might be having to these conversations. Okay, I'll share. Thank you. Um, so I think my journey with wanting to live ethically kind of um, maybe started about like 14, 15 years ago and then it swings. Like sometimes like I'm really trying to live ethically and then like, and then I find myself in another times I'm like completely forgot about it, just being careless. <laughs> and then just like, and then like wanting to be ethical again. And then so, um, I, th I think, yeah, yeah, since these classes, like, um, it's definitely, I'm definitely like, you know, uh, like putting more intention and like having more awareness, like, for example, like grocery shopping, and I'm just like calculating, oh my God, this like strawberry here, but it's in, in the plastic. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I have calculating like additional things to calculate. <laughs> what are the pros and cons? And um, so, and uh, I think I really like the embodying part. And then um, I think I was just um, this like try like feeling things in the body is sort of a new thing for me. So I think um, it's not the first thing, like, you know, I'm aware of like bodily, sometimes it happens. Like for example, like, um, um, so I think that's a very great compass that you give us. And then what I also realized is like how I'm also like very disconnected from it is that like last weekend um, I was at this party and then the somebody, a girl, I fell down like and she I thought she was like dancing and then I was a little bit confused like what just happened and then she started having a seizure and then I just kind of like froze and then somebody said like don't touch her so I'm just like standing there and then I wasn't even aware what was going on inside me and then I'm just like standing there I'm just thinking like okay I gotta like leave some space for her to like breathe <laughs> and then later I left and then I was standing in the bathroom like in the line and then I realized like my my heart's like started like, really racing that's when I realized oh like I'm having some kind of a panic attack right now <laughs> like and I didn't even know that. <laughs> and then I'm realizing it like way after. So that's kind of showed me like, oh my God, I'm so disconnected from like how things feel. So I think it's a really great, um, like I'm, I'm definitely gonna be feeling like um, doing this practice of, okay, how is it feeling in my body? So mm. thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sarana. Yeah, every, everything that you shared, awareness, 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 right? <laughs> yeah. And we, we 
you may have heard me say this before, like a lot of times people ask in the, in the body scan, it's like, why are we paying attention to our toes? Like, why, why do we spend so much time in our feet and like our ethics are in toes? Like why? Because it's the same neural pathway. So when we focus on being with the experience in our toes, it's the same neural pathway that allows us to feel a sensation around the strawberry wrapped in plastic, right? So we're still strengthening. Um, so the, the, the basic, I shouldn't say the basic, but the mindfulness practice of just being with sensations in the body as they are is like the training ground for exactly what you're sharing there. Thank you for thank you for illustrating that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the girl that was fell down, she's fine. She she got up. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else want to chime in before we move into our reflection? I really appreciate the, the themes. You know, I think everyone used the word or a variation of the word intention. You know, like I think that that's, it's like awareness. I think we can probably say as we start to wrap up this series of classes that a lot of this ethical ways of being is a combination of intention and awareness. Those are like the ground that these ethics arise from. Um, so thank you for those that shared. Um, through spoken word and through heart, you know, like that these are the, um, the foundations of ethical ways to be mindfulness as an ethic, knowing your values as an ethic, um, sustainable hedonism as an ethic, the light within as an ethic, um, practice as an ethic, you know, we don't, I think that's the thing that I have been learning as teaching this is there is a set of ethics, you know, if you Google ethics or you go to chat GPT, it gives you a list of what ethics are. But a lot of the things that we're talking about here wouldn't show up on that list. Uh, mindfulness as an ethic or the inner light as an ethic to help us stop consuming so much. Um, I think it's really interesting when I hear you all sharing that um, these are your, your explorations and how you deal with ar what arises from it. You know, I heard a lot of like self-compassion, like, oh, this is hard, or, oh, I didn't do great with that today. It makes sense, I'm taking care of my mom, you know? Like, it's hard for me to worry about the plastic wrap fruit right now. Like, that's self-compassion, you know? So not beating ourselves up when we find that we are, um, when we do have a footprint, you know? Um, it's really more about the intention. Um, and, and protecting, you know, I think, as, as I mentioned, kind of how do we use meditation? How do we use contemplative practice as a means of cultivating intention, cultivating our awareness and protecting our mind, the mental formations, the heart um, and, and, our, and our bodies from these unethical systems that we're surrounded by, that we're living in, but also participating in. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I want to make a transition into what we call a vision quest. So many of you have probably done this with me in the past. This is going to be a little bit different because it's swayed towards ethics. So uh, I figured that this would be a really great practice to do for our last practice together. Kind of how do we want to move forward? What does that look like, feel like, sound like? What do we need more of? What support do we need? Um, what do we need to let go of or stop doing? Um, and so this practice is going to be a series of five questions. We normally do four, but there's a bonus one this time. Uh, so I'm going to um, ask these questions and leave some space for you to think, uh, feel, imagine, visualize, I also want to invite anyone that is feeling more in the mood to journal. This could be a great time for a mindful writing practice. Um, there will be some times where uh, after each question, I ask you to just sit with what comes up. That's where you would probably be writing. And then there's a point where you'd be invited to feel. And so if you are deciding to journal for this, then when you hear that, then maybe stop writing and just take some time to come into that interoception or felt sense of what's happening in the body um, as you reflect. 
So um, this will be about 15 minutes um, and you're welcome to do this as a meditation uh, or you can do it as a writing exercise. So whatever's feeling available for you and then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for sharing. Um, so with that, let's start to transition back into an awareness of our inner world. Maybe just taking a moment to take a few deep breaths or anchor your awareness into a sensation of the ground making contact with the body. And just inviting the awareness back into this moment, this breath, this sensation of body. And so our first question to consider, whether it's through thought forms or visualization or writing, what does an ethical world look like for you? And the answers may come up as short statements or singular words or shapes or colors. But what does the dream of an ethical world look like? sound like? How are people acting, moving through the world in ethical ways? And you may notice along the way during these reflection questions that the mind may switch into doubt or questioning or trying to figure things out. And really we're just cultivating an image of a world that is ethical, that's constructive, benevolent. A world where we care for ourselves and each other a world where we have freedom and liberty, but not at anyone else's expense, including the planet. And then taking a moment to notice, how does that feel? Imagining that we already live in this perfect world and just taking a moment to notice how that might feel. And if you are journaling, perhaps consider leaving some space to come back to and fill in because we move into our second question. So coming back into this world that we live now, what does acting ethically look like for you in this world? What does it sound like? How are you moving through the world? How do your intentions and aspirations to not cause harm, to be of greater benefit to the planet and others, what does that look like?
And again, this might be coming as images. It might be coming as statements or words. But as you imagine living life ethically, how does that feel? What sensations or emotions arise as you imagine living within this system ethically? And again, noticing if any doubt arises or any self-criticism. And allow that to be there, but shift your attention to resting with how does it feel to move and act ethically in the world? And whether you're writing or practicing a more traditional meditation, just resting the awareness with the feeling that arises. And then gathering up the attention from wherever it may be right now as we start to transition to the next question. What action would you like to take to do more, to act more ethically? And another way of considering this question is to ask what support might I need to live closer to the aspiration of constructive ways of being in the world. So what would you like to do more of? Or what support would you love to receive to support your moving through the world in ethical ways? And just a reminder here that these can be hedonic or eudaimonic. So it could be support that's coming from external sources, or it could be so support that's cultivated from within. What would you love to do more of, or what support would you love to receive in order to support a more ethical way of being? And then taking a moment to imagine that you've already received the support, that you're already doing these actions. And take a moment as you hold this image in your mind's eye to feel. What does it feel like as you see yourself receiving the support or carrying out these more benevolent ways of being? How does that feel? What sensations do you notice arising?
and no expectation that these sensations or feelings should be one way or the other, just being curious of what arises when you imagine being in the world in this way, receiving the support, how does that feel? Of course, it's great when it feels pleasant, but even in unpleasant feelings, there are messages and insights. And then shifting to our fourth question, what do you need to stop doing? Or what do you need to let go of to move towards this image of moving through the world in a more beneficial and constructive manner? So things to let go of might be outdated thought patterns, beliefs that our happiness comes from the outside. Perhaps it's specific actions that are causing harm that we would like to set an intention to stop doing. And again, noticing if there's any self-critical thoughts that are arising. And perhaps frame that as an opportunity to empower yourself for change. And an invitation here to imagine that you've already stopped doing this activity or thought, action, or imagining that you've already let go of whatever it is that needs to be let go of. And with that image in mind, how does it feel? And gathering up all the attention and coming to our last reflection question. So with this image in mind of acting ethically and benevolently, benevolently in the world, receiving all the support that you need to do this, letting go of or stopping what you'd like to release, imagining that you're moving through the world in ethical ways, what is your gift to the world? How does acting ethically provide for others or for the planet? And perhaps taking a moment here to imagine that you're giving this gift to another person or group of people or to the planet. And again, notice how that feels to make this offering, to give this gift of ethical ways of being. And just like we did in our earlier reflection, see if it's possible to label that feeling or put a name to it.
And perhaps considering this word or name or label or feeling as your intention to embody ethics. And before we come to an end of the practice, let's just take a moment to release any visualization or thought forms and just take a moment to be with what's here now. Just taking a moment to notice any energy that has shifted over the course of this reflection. Perhaps noticing how you're feeling in body, mind, and heart. And then taking your time to start transitioning out of that period of reflection in a way that feels supportive for you, perhaps making some movement blinking the eyes open. <clears throat> so thank you for joining me in that reflection. I'd love to spend the rest of our time um, sharing. You know, maybe we can start just by putting a word into the chat or speaking out loud what that, that feeling or that intention is that came up at the end. Uh, for me, my word was satisfied. Um, so if anyone wants to speak that into vibration with sound or perhaps put it in the chat, share any experiences that may have come up. So we have a range coming through, clarity, resolution, love, disorganized, lonely, a series of punctuation marks. Was it actually, <laughs> what word was actually pride? Mm. Yeah. So would anyone like to share a little bit more? <clears throat> One thing that came up for me through several of them was kind of, well, kind of weird was a sense of adulthood. I feel like we are culturally we're we are so self constrained by all the pressures. It is actually tough to be centered and make those ethical choices and the other part of that was like when they have, I imagine making, being able to live that way, um, it feels very aligned, like all of my parts working together, which kind of goes to some of my other practices. Um, and as a random thing, there's a book called Always Coming Home by Ursula Gwynn, which is a novel about a future Northwest where people are trying to do this, trying to live with the earth and make ethical government and things like that, just as a random thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Lynn. <clears throat>
Which book, though? The book that Lance mentioned, the oh. Ursula Le Guin book. I didn't catch the title, Lance, if you wouldn't mind sharing. I think it was Always Coming Home, but Always Coming Home, yeah. Always Coming Home, thank you. It feels kind of similar what Lance was sharing to what Sarana put here in the chat. It feels like I'm in the flow of the universe, kind of like that central. I, th I think, I don't know if you use that word Lance, but there was some, some kind of like gesture coming here. And when I hear flow of the universe, I think of kind of like flowing through the center. <clears throat> yeah, very much. I tend to think of the self having different parts, you know, first parts and spirit parts and aligning all of those things to the center so that they're hmm. coast and all express. Yeah, interesting. It's really interesting to think of like ethical ways of being as a part of ourself. I, I think that's really, I, I personally, taking my teacher hat off just as a human, <laughs> feel like that's something that I want to sit with. Like, oh, this is actually a part of me. And that feels really, thank you for adding that, you know, to, to the to the circle because it feels really like um, it helps me name something that has felt very abstract and amorphous, you know, that the ethics could actually be a part of us. I appreciate that and how they relate to the other parts too. Thank you. So before we wrap up, I, I want to just uh, note that the disorganized and lonely feeling and, and just create some space if, if you feel like that's something that you wanna share a little bit more about Cecily or um, what feels comfortable for you. Hey, this is Cecily, thank you. Um, so I'm new to thinking about ethics in um, a Buddhist context. I'm used to thinking of ethics in a social justice and activist context where once we identify the need, then we make a plan and then we go outside. And sometimes we yell a lot um, or write letters, but there's action, or, um, collective action. And what's really cute for me is that I've been hanging out with anarchists with my top down um, capitalist business hat on and I came here and I'm like guys aren't even like organized or anything because <laughs> you're all individual how did I stop it that's so cute I'm like no one made a plan and told me what to do I have to think of it on my own like I'm an individual what's up with that <laughs> that's delightful that's two years of hanging out with anarchists and being the top-down person and then I come here and everyone's like yes I have this plan I shall do it I'm like, what will I do who will tell me what to do mm. that was delightful thank you What's... thank you for letting me talk that out yeah thanks for sharing that and and do you see because those are two very different approaches and I'm sure that there are benefits and challenges with both approaches now that, because I think you've been in majority of these classes, how do you feel now moving forward from, from the series of exploring ethics, given those two different approaches? I'm um, having talked it out just now, I realized that um, the things I'm already doing are great. And what I was feeling was the lack, <laughs> I'm awesome, right? so fine. I was fine when I got here. What I was feeling was the lack of the beautiful ahas that everyone else was having. Because I, I don't have an aha to share because I made my plans and my choices and now I'm doing them. Just kind of boring. Like the steadiness. You don't get to talk about it. Like, you want to do the thing. Um, and that's very silly. It's just oh. a very silly sort of, I don't get to share show and tell. <laughs> Um, but I could have, I could have told you what I was doing, mm. but it didn't feel like a revelation. That's what it was. Mm. And so uh, I felt a little bit outside of that moment. 
Um, so the answer to your question is uh, all of these weeks, um, our conversations have uh, reaffirmed the things that I have been doing, which is very cool. Hmm. Yeah. I just, I'd never thought of them in a Buddhist context before. So that's hmm. the part that's new. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, I'm glad to hear that, you know, because I think even if we were to just take ethics off the table for a second and just think about like contemplative practice, that like we all have everybody in this group and that has been in this series of classes and those that are listening to this recorded on YouTube in the future have a meditation practice, but it's still helpful to come together and practice as a community, practice as a sangha and hear other people's um, experiences, even if we don't really need the meditation instruction. I think I mentioned last week, I kind of had a realization halfway through the series of like, these probably aren't the people that really need this class, right? <laughs> and, but it is really helpful because I think it helps prop us up. It helps, re, you know, I think of motivation as kind of like the gas in the tank that keeps us going. And so what I was really appreciating about what you're sharing is it's, it was, it's almost like um, you're, it was like a check-in, you're able to check in on things, you know, and hear other people's and then hold the space for other people as well and, and, and participate. So I really appreciate um, your sentiments there. Um, I wanted to just end with two things. So one, in that practice of the vision quest, you know, we talk, there's a lot of invitation there to not just think about, but also feel. And so what we're doing is kind of like tuning ourselves to what a feeling uh, or, or what it would be like to live in an ethical world or to act in according to our ethical standards as a way of, you know, like solidifying these neural connections in the brain. We know how we become more familiar with it. We start seeking out pathways towards it. Um, so really important. It's not just like a pipe dream of oh, what would this world be like if everything was ethical? It's more of starting to familiarize ourselves with that feeling uh, so that we can move closer to it. Uh, it's it's very similar to an intention where we need to point ourselves in the direction. We need to start vibrating in the direction that aligned in the direction that we want to go. So, um, just wanted to comment on why that aspect of that that reflection is so important that we have to feel it. Um, and I wanted to end with this kind of coming coming back to the idea of unimonea, and I've been really thinking about. Um, even even though this has been presented more in a secular format, I, I can't help but think a lot about the dying words of the Buddha: "Seek no external salvation, and make yourself a lamp." You know, I think those were that was his last teaching, and it really relates directly to this eudaimonia. You know, so that if we if we look within everything that we need is there it's really just uncovering it and i feel very firmly that ethics are something that we do need to talk about that we need to explore that we need to investigate but ultimately they're already here just with our just like with our our kindness and compassion their innate qualities of the human heart of our experience of embodiment and yes, there are things that are covering and blocking, you know, all those petals of the lotus when it's covered up, we need to, we need to open it up. Um, and so really kind of ending, ending this series of classes with that reflection, I, you know, Noam and I have been talking a lot about naming these classes. And so this class would be named the hope that is you and that the, the, um, the overwhelm that I can feel when I think about capitalism and government and ingrained ways of thinking that are now part of our DNA, uh, that we actually have the answer. We have the antidote, we have the medicine for all of this and it's inside each of us. It will happen more effectively when we come together as a community or organizations or countries, uh, but the starting point of all of this is you, it's the individual. And so if we do these practices, we engage with in life with these intentions and aspirations, I fully trust that we will be taken care of. 
um, it will be difficult as we shared, you know, through this whole series of class. This is really hard. This is really uncomfortable. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of practice. But what's hard about it is the uncovering. It's already there. We just have to turn inside and look. So thank you for those that have been on the journey through the past two months. Uh, I really appreciate the platform to kind of explore and um, share and come together as a community to talk about ethics and how we can practice them. So deep bows uh, for everyone that has been participating that is here and those that are not. Um, so thank you. Uh, Shifting gears a little bit, I do want to make a very quick announcement. Um, we at the Dharma Collective is um, undergoing a survey. Um, so I'm putting a link in the chat right now um, that can take you directly to the survey. And this survey is not related to this course in particular. If you want to talk about it, that's cool. But uh, it's more about as an organization. Um, and so what have your experience has been like? What are your suggestions? What can we improve on? Also, there's some um, basic demographic information so we can understand who our Sangha is and um, how we can better meet the needs of our community. So it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to fill out. Um, that link will take you right to the form. And uh, as you'll see, the name of the survey is called Voice of the Sangha. So the Dharma Collective, there is no one person that is kind of guiding this. It's all of us together. So it's really important that we get to hear everyone, um, that your voice will contribute to decisions that are made for programming and the space and how we move forward as an organization. So um, gratitude in advance for taking some time and energy to fill that out. 